if you don't yeah. address it, you bring it in to your next relationship. And then mm. if the first relationship broke up, perhaps because you wasn't trusting, because you have a deep rooted belief that someone's always going to cheat on you, because maybe in their childhood, that's what they saw. Maybe their parents split up. They saw terrible stuff happening. Then mum got another partner and he cheated on her. And then da 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 da, da. So therefore, their belief about relationships is th- don't trust anyone because it's going to end up badly. Welcome to the Love You Want podcast. This podcast is about empowering yourself in your relationships so you can then go on to find and attract the kind of relationships that you truly deserve and desire. This is your host, Anne Helgren, and I'm so glad you're here today. If you want a show that is open and unapologetic about the complexities of romantic relationships, you've come to the right place. Let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Love You Want podcast with your host, myself, Anne Helgren. I am really excited to have this guest on today. We align in the kind of work that we do. She's fantastic at what she does. And I'm really excited to have this conversation because I feel like it's going to bring so much value to all of you who are listening in today. I think it's something that affects a lot of us consciously or subconsciously. So without further ado, my guest today is Julie Fitzpatrick. She's the founder of Millicide Therapy and Coaching. She works with entrepreneurs and business owners to help them uncover their true potential so they become truly unstoppable in whatever they want to achieve. So, Julie, thank you once again so much for being here. Please introduce yourself and take it away. Thank you so much, darling. Thank you for inviting me onto your wonderful podcast. Yeah, as you said, I support business owners, professionals. And what I do is getting them to really uncover their limiting beliefs and eradicating them, really. Um, And we do that by going deep, deep into the root cause of their issues and also teaching them really how to understand the power of their imagination and the power of their mind, because we spend all our lives, really, most of us using our imagination in a negative way insofar as like fear, anxiety, lack of confidence and things like that, they're all using our imagination about worrying about things that are never going to happen probably, right? So I work with my clients in a coaching and a therapeutic way. So I teach them lots of tools and techniques to help them work with that. So I teach them how to ground themselves, how to listen to the language they're using, different hypnotic meditations and things like that but the real work I do is really digging deep to the root cause of their either physical or psychological conditions getting to the root cause eradicating it and then replacing that with new empowering beliefs which happens in about a month really from end to end but it really really is amazing and to be honest it's the most powerful thing I've ever done. And I've got quite a lot of experience of doing different things, but this really gets to the root. And and my tagline is all about become unstoppable. So yeah, that's I love that. kind of in a nutshell <laughs> what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, you talk about the therapy aspect. And as a coach myself, I know that one thing that I love about coaching is that there's a lot of focus on where we are now and how we can work on a better future. And then there's Mm. a therapeutic side of things. And my background is also psychology and therapy as such, but it's not something I practice very much of, shall I say. I'm more Mm. on the the coaching side of aspect. I look into people's past trauma using some tools and training, but I really want to find out from your perspective and in your coaching and therapy practice, what kind of tools do you use specifically within the therapy side? Because I think digging down and finding out the root causes of why we behave the way we behave, the programming that we have and how it's affecting us consciously and subconsciously is so powerful. Mm-hmm. I mean, so when I work with my clients, I mean, I, I they can have, they can work me work with me for a different period of time, but as a minimum, we can work together for one month and one month only, right? And in that time, 
we can uncover so much information and and help it. So when I do my initial call with them, I'm finding out, I get them to tick box some certain things and I'm getting like a bigger picture of how many areas of their life that they need to work on. But if it's only kind of like a small segment, then we can do so much in one session. Because the beauty of what I do is if you're suffering, say, for example, from anxiety, then probably you're suffering from lack of confidence as well. And you're probably procrastinating, probably self-sabotaging, right? Because they're all similar areas. They're all kind of fear-based. So by getting to the root cause, you're more than likely to tick off more than one thing. So if someone puts on their form that they got 30 things wrong with them, <laughs> it doesn't mean you're going to have to do it 30 times. You will do it. Ma- maximum I've ever done it is three, actually. I haven't had anyone really so far longer than three not unless they've come back after a longer period of time because where they've mulled over their life and they've gone oh do you know what now I want to work on this so you go to a deeper level sometimes don't you if you imagine being an onion you take off a layer and then you're seeing what's underneath and then you've got to work with that and then you might need to take another layer off but basically what I'm doing in in that time that they're with me the core of it is doing what I call my rewire process Whereas I'm going to regress them back using hypnosis, which is a deep meditational state. It's a trance-like state, right? It's it's your body just calming down and your mind calming down so that we can actually tap in to your subconscious. And I know you know this, but I don't know that everyone else does, that 5% of our brain is conscious and 95 is subconscious. And when we're in a constant state of stress and overwhelm and anxiety, we aren't able always to tap into our subconscious mind and that's why we struggle trying to remember anything isn't it or oh I don't know where that information's gone so by being in that deep meditational state I then ask my clients it couldn't be relationships actually so let's lose like use relationships right because obviously I know this is a theme of your podcast so let's keep it you know real for your listeners so if someone says I really struggle with relationships Every relationship that I find, I keep self-sabotaging it or I keep attracting the wrong type of person. Every All my partners seem to be narcissists or everyone just seems to treat me really badly. So it's about understanding why that is. Now, talking consciously, we can cover off a lot of things. But if we haven't uncovered the limiting belief, we're not really going to change So you and I could be talking now and I could go, look, Anne, I I can understand why you're behaving like that. This is because of this happened in your childhood. And you go, oh, yeah, Julie, I I, I get that. And I say, well, you know, Anne, you really are more than enough, don't you? And I go, yeah, yeah, I know I am. So you can have that conscious level conversation. And then as soon as that conversation ends and we walk away, you go straight to your subconscious and it goes, yeah, but Anne, you're not good enough, are you? Because that's your uncovering, you know, your, your rooted belief. So you can talk and talk, but it's not changing that. Yeah. It's getting to that part. And we do that in the session by, I'll say to you, right, uh, I'm not using you as an example, obviously. I'm making this up, everybody. I don't know anything about Anne's part. <laughs> I'll say, look, Anne, what we're going to do, I'm going to, in, in this hypnotic state, I want you to go back to a place, a time, an event that's all to do with when relationships first become an issue for you. And then I do some jiggery pokery, and then I go, right where are you and by a scene we mean a memory right so they might go oh I'm in the playground okay how old are you I'm five what's happening I feel I'm, I'm in the park on my own or something how does that make you feel it makes me feel sad and we go through and we uncover the feelings and emotions but we also uncover where you're actually feeling it in your body it might be oh my, my stomach feels horrible Anyway, yeah. we do that a few times and we do lots of other things within the scene. And we, we're actually trying to understand what that limiting belief is or beliefs are. Now, mainly it'll be I'm not good enough. I didn't have my needs met. I was unlovable and I felt different. Very often it's one of those or a few of those. Sorry, Julie, to interrupt. Yeah. Just repeat those four again, because I think it's really important for the listeners to understand this. And I know that it's something as well I touch on during my coaching sessions, talking about where our limiting beliefs come from. 
And sometimes people tend to overcomplicate things, but a lot mm. of the times you'll find the, the research shows that it boils back down to usually to a handful of beliefs mm. that we have come to take as our truths and therefore fall into this one thing after another that's created a programming that creates our behavior, our thought patterns, and makes us show up in a way that we know we don't want to be showing up, but we're just like, I don't understand why I keep attracting the wrong people. You know, that's something I, I talk about a lot as well. And it's, and I keep saying, you are the common denominator. If you find yourself from one dysfunctional relationship to another, to another, I mean it with love, but you are the common denominator <laughs> yes. and you need to understand, right? <laughs> why? And I can say that with love because I was the common denominator and I have receipts to show it, you know? So yeah. it's not a judgment, but I, I'm talking from experience. So just repeat those four limiting beliefs that we, we've created for the listeners out there as well important to know that we can form these limiting beliefs at different stages of our lives. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, childhood is very commonplace, but mm -hmm. even as teenagers, even as adults, so don't dismiss where you might have started to get mm. these four beliefs. So go ahead, Julie, just repeat those yeah. for us, please. I'm not enough. Yes. I wasn't lovable. I didn't have my knees met. And I was different. Yeah. That was different. The I'm different one's quite an interesting one because that, that quite often they will go back to school times mm. and it could be oh they was always bullied. Um they might have had I've had a client that had ginger hair. It, it could be anything like or someone who's got a bit of a learning disability or maybe someone who wasn't as attractive as some of the other people. It, it could be anything, the yes. way you're dressing. And and that hasn't this is why I would get so angry when I see people that are bullies or you hear about people being bullied and it's like do you realize the damage that you're doing to those people just because you actually don't love yourself you're projecting that into them aren't you and that really makes me sad when people are bullied like that and then like you said about beliefs mostly not always as you said but a lot of a big percentage of beliefs are between zero and seven which I find really frightening <laughs> Because it's like, you know, most people who don't have the luxury of uncovering theirs and eradicating them, you're living your life on old software. You know, yeah. anyone, any of your listeners, right, I bet there'll be very few, if any, that have got, for example, a phone, mobile phone, that's older, older than five years old, right? Because they start, they don't work, do they, after a while, especially if you're an iPhone girl like I am. You know, they suddenly start slowing down, don't they? And then it just doesn't work anymore and you start getting frustrated. And But we're all, we're quite happy to run our lives on a belief that we created when we were five or running a multi-million pound business on beliefs that we've created when we were seven. That's, yes. that's all right, is it? But yeah. it's crazy. It is. It's a very good analogy as well that you say there. It's like if you are not interested in evolving yourself and wondering – being more curious as well. If there mm. is something that I'm experiencing in my life that seems to be hindering me, there's a belief, there's a behavior, there's a pattern. And sometimes it doesn't even need to be a pattern. Sometimes it could just basically be a thought. Mm -hmm. So it's not a repeated behavior that you're carrying out, but a thought. And not challenging yourself. Again, there's no judgment here. I just want people to understand we're not two coaches here attacking you for not going for coaching. <laughs> We don't roll like that, like that, I promise you. Yeah. <laughs> We're not those kind of coaches. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but um, just getting curious about how can I uh, improve my thought process, my behaviors? How can I turn up at a higher version, especially if you feel that there is some kind of belief or thought that is hindering you? I was having a really interesting conversation the other day, um, Julie, with uh, a friend of mine. And I know I've spoken about this in the past and we've, we've touched on this with you as well. And I really want to get your insight on this. Mm -hmm. And it was about how as children growing up in Kenya, and I know this is true for a lot of other cultures and uh, generations as well, where people were allowed to beat children in school or in the home. Mm -hmm. It was seen as a sense of, quote unquote, discipline. And we know it still happens as well. I'm going to speak from my own experience. Having gone through that in schools and then 
you couldn't even go home and tell your parents you'd been beaten by your teacher because the automatic response was like, what did you do? You must have been in the wrong. And so you're beaten again, you know? And so we grew up and we, but the beating was serious. You know, it was like, go get your own stick. You're beaten with a stick until it breaks. And then you beaten with another stick. If you took a stick that was too small with rulers, mm. water hoses, et cetera. The, the reason I'm bringing this up is that when we were growing up, and we can sit and talk about this as grown-ups with my Kenyan friends. And the interesting thing is, we don't even perceive, well, okay, let me not say we as Kenyans as collective, obviously. I'm talking about my group of friends that I'm speaking with, but all Kenyan. Funny how we do not perceive that as abuse. Because there was, a, I think there's a couple of aspects. It was so normalized, for one. So our programming taught us it is normal. So how is it abuse? It's normal. Well, that's what we saw in, in our home, in our school, et cetera. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because then we talked about the lack of emotional support that was felt or uh, bringing up children in a culture that did not very openly express physical affection or emotional affection. It was like, I love you. You know, I love you. Why should I have to keep telling you? You know, you know, it wasn't, it was a bit more of that, like hardcore, it's not even hardcore, I don't want to call it hardcore, but I think lack of a better name, it was more, it was emotionally removed more so than now, more, way more so than I would ever raise my kids for one. Uh, again, it's not a blame game to our parents. They also inherited this way of behaving through their own parents and generations and generations. They did what they knew. You can't blame them for that. That was their programming. But what I want to bring up uh, around this programming is how we can take on an idea of what is healthy and unhealthy and might seem crazy to other people, but it is our truth. So someone might go, how do you not think that kind of beating was abuse, but yet you think your parents not being very emotionally affectionate towards you was what caused you trauma. And when we look, and I promise you, when I look at myself, and a lot of my friends, a lot of the trauma that we carry, because we do, we is around the emotional aspect, not even the physical beating. And so I've found it quite fascinating how, you know, looking at the zero to seven years old of development, and even after that, everyone's truth and everyone's trauma is true to them. And I'm just for the listeners listening in, just to be encouraged that your trauma might look different from what is expected of others and that's okay but it is still your trauma it is still your truth yeah I mean you don't have to have had a traumatic childhood to have issues and by issues I mean have disturbed limiting beliefs or mm. aka any of those four we mentioned yeah or others because quite a lot of people have asked me that before. I mean, I didn't have a traumatic childhood, for example. I had a loving childhood. Funny enough, what you were saying there, I mean, I can remember it was it was very much, wait till your father gets home. You know, like, poor, you know what a terrible way to bring your children up. And it just, the, the, the <laughs> get bigger was like, you know, oh. but my dad was a bit of a softy anyway. But mm -hmm. I can remember being, we, we would get hit, like, bare, you know, if you had trousers on, pull the trousers down, smack you on the legs, because obviously that hurt more. And the amount of times my mum, because I've got two sisters, she used to say, that's it, I'm leaving, I'm packing my bags, and, you know, and all this kind of thing. <laughs> but that was, like you say, that was kind of like normal. And it was very yeah. much, um, you know, don't cry, especially for boys. Boys don't cry. Yes. And it was all yeah. about holding in your feelings and your emotions, which couldn't be further from the truth. That is the worst thing you could possibly do. And... Even for myself, although I would say that I'm quite an emotional person, like I could watch something on telly and I'd bore my eyes out instantly. I think about my poor doggy who I lost in May. I can cry like a baby at any time. Not because I'm a drama queen, just because I've always been emotional. But to actually learn to embody feelings and emotions and release them in that way, I've never been able, I've never done it until now. So I, I'm at that time in my life where at the end of last year, I quit my corporate life. So I spent 35 years working in the corporate world to be fully focused on my business. 
So I would say like I've always kind of like lived in my head. And it's only like doing continual therapy because I I continue to learn all the time. So I'm I'm in a group called the Rise and Shine Academy and who work with coaches and therapists. But it's about they give us all the tools and techniques that I'm learning. I'm learning them for myself to embed and embody, but also I can lift and shift and do those on my clients, which is really useful. And it's only now, and don't get me wrong, if this is my journey, I'm probably here, but learning to actually feel things and release things in my body so that I can just release them. Now, I would say I've been lucky in touch wood that I don't really suffer from any physical conditions. But what I've also learned in this journey is if you do not release your feelings and emotions, then you can store them and you store them as either physical conditions like autoimmune diseases, arthritis, actually, you name it, anything really. Yeah. It could be. It Answer. Could have, yeah, it could have, because yeah. we create this ease in our body. Stress yeah. is the worst of it all, really which is why that's the first thing I do when I work with my clients. We look at what, you know, your stress and overwhelm. And then it could be that we could release you of that by doing the session that I spoke I spoke about earlier, because you might be holding it in arthritis in your leg or something. Yeah. Because it, it is very much mind, body and soul. It is also connected. But not many of us realise that and actually follow that whole cycle, I suppose. I'm wondering as well from your work that you've done how you've how you've seen your clients who've come to you um, not really dealt with you know the four things that we spoke about there how their own relationships are affected like so what what do they tend to bring to the table first of all do they tend to have healthy relationships or or do they have any kind of relationships and also, secondly, what do those relationships tend to look like when you haven't dealt with the inner trauma or reprogramming that needs to be done? How it then goes on, not just to yourself. So obviously, you've mentioned about yourself, it causing you disease in, and disease. And mm. what is the knock-on effect on that? And to the uh, romantic relationships and also other relationships, parenting, uh, how they are with you know, work colleagues, just relationships in general, how you're, how they're turning up. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. A relationship's not necessarily a partner. It could be relationship mm -hmm. with their children. It could be yeah. relationships in their work or if they're a business owner, they could be great at what they do, but they're rubbish at managing staff because they just don't get it or don't understand all this woo woo mental health stuff. Just get a grip, just get on with it. So that's a good example, right? So someone who's yeah. been brought up in that environment that boys don't cry, don't show your feelings, don't show your emotions, you're how are you gonna acknowledge that in anyone else? Because you're gonna your learnt behaviour is gonna impact your staff, even, isn't it? Because you don't know any different. And like mm -hmm. you said earlier, it's not really their fault because you know, I always say to my clients, if they've had a terrible childhood you know it's not really your parents fault they were dealing with life in the best way they knew how it might have been shocking but that was that was what they knew right so I think relationships is much broader than just a loving relationship but what I've found is quite often people are I mean I'm in I'm on my second marriage so you know it happens to a lot of us but I think this day and age now we are very much a throwaway society and if we come across troubles in our relationship, many people, not all, find it easier just to break up because they don't necessarily want or know that there's an alternative. And a lot of people will go, you know, couple counselling or something, but that might be a little bit too late. I did that. I went too late. But we went through the motions just because you felt like that's what you should do. But it didn't it didn't work in our case. But equally, when I met my now husband, you inadvertently bring in the history from the other person. And I can remember Andy's my current husband saying, why are you saying that? I'm not Kevin. Kevin was my first husband. And I go, oh, yeah, you're not, are you? So you, you kind of if you don't yeah. address it, you bring it in to your next relationship. And then mm -hmm. if the first relationship broke up, perhaps because you wasn't trusting 
because you have a deep rooted belief that someone's always going to cheat on you because maybe in their childhood that's what they saw maybe their parents split up they saw terrible stuff happening then mum got another partner and he cheated on her and then da, 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 da. so therefore their belief about relationships is that don't trust anyone because it's going to end up badly and yeah. You have that relationship and then you get in a, what you think might be a good relationship, but then you start sabotaging it because they can't possibly love you for who you are because no one else did because you're un, you're, mm. you know, your root belief is I'm not good enough or I'm, un, I'm unlovable. Mm. I'll, I'll give you an example. Actually, I had one client once who she was in a, what she thought was a really good relationship at that, mm-hmm. you know, currently in a good relationship, but she wanted to work on whether, she wanted to have a baby with him or not she wasn't Mm -hmm. sure whether she wanted to have kids she didn't think she wanted children right but she wasn't sure whether she just didn't want children because there's no law that says you have to have children right subject to what (laughs) parents might think um Mm -hmm. or was she not having them because her words were because if I ever have a baby when the relationship fails I'm gonna left be left holding the baby so it was like oh that's interesting so you've already ended that relationship before you've even gone through in the relationship and it was like oh but when we regressed her back I can't remember all of the scenes but I remember this one the very first scene we went back to she was about five or six in this scene this memory her dad was sitting on the sofa and she wasn't feeling very well so she went up for a cuddle with her dad now for some reason her dad pushed her away I'm not lovable now the reality of that situation probably was something like he was probably watching telly or something and maybe she frightened him and he's gone you know like that Mm. but as a five-year-old who's got no logic because our brains haven't developed enough then she's created that belief Mm. either I wasn't good enough or I was unlovable I can't remember what it was right Mm. so straight away she's got that belief now you do something similar once or twice more in your life, or it could just that could just be enough. But I normally regress them back to about two or three scenes. So we would have done a couple more, but I can't remember what they were now. But yeah. something as simple as that, she's already creating that belief. Now it doesn't make her mean her dad was a horrible dad, but just for that nanosecond, he didn't do what was expected. Now, as a parent, how many times have you snapped at your children? or told them off or ignored them maybe because you was in the mood or you was tired but they could have taken that belief that you don't care about them now I don't want to scare the pants off everybody but (laughs) if I did all my training on this I was like oh my god and when I saw my son next my son's 23 now and I went Josh I just want to apologize he said apologize for what I went I don't know but anything that I've done that's really messed you up, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because it's scary, isn't it? You know? Yeah. It, yeah. What, who's to say what a perfect parent is? Because if you if you tell them off all the time, that's wrong. If you let them yes. off everything and don't have any discipline, that's wrong. If you're yes. overbearing, that's wrong, isn't it? If you're not loving them enough, that's wrong. To actually get, I don't know, I don't know what the answer is. But there's a f- very fine line between being a great parent and not. Yeah, definitely. And I think because there is no such thing as a manual on how to be a good parent because no. every single child is different as well. So mm. I've, I, you know, I've got a daughter and I've got a son and the needs for my son and my daughter are very different. How my son is very more cuddly 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 all over mommy all the time and you know my daughter is also very cuddly but she's more like oh let's do stuff together she wants to do like more the physical stuff my son just wants cuddle and kisses and he's happy and tickles you know of course there's an age gap as well so he's much younger but at the same time you know different personalities as well you can have twins but their needs will be different how mm. they want to be communicated to will be different how they That's want true. to be shown love is going to be different right we all have our own love languages not just with our partners but with our parents with our um mm. parenting relationship and i'm yeah. just wondering as well as we were speaking as well something came up to me um you know going back to our programming and i i mentioned this that everyone's programming is true to themselves no matter 
how relevant or irrelevant it might look to others. What is important is that you're true to yourself and that you acknowledge that it hurt you or that it caused you some sort of trauma, seek out the help and so on. Mm. And I think I just wanted to touch on the fact that I, I'm just going to keep it very real. Okay. And again, there's no judgment here. There, I'm not trying to belittle anyone in any way, form and shape. I really want people to understand this. But we live in a culture sometimes, I feel, at the moment, that everyone's walking on eggshells, mm. especially when it comes to what you're allowed to say to someone and what you're not allowed to say before someone takes offense to everything that's being said. And everything's causing everyone some kind of trauma. And I've had this conversation with many people as well uh, across different ages. So I don't want to say it's just like, oh, it's because you're 40 plus or whatever mm -hmm. that you think that way. And someone who is 23 has a different. I've had this conversation with 18 year olds as well who feel like people are getting too butt hurt over everything, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite curious. I kind of think sometimes if everyone's being so offended these days by everything and anything that's being said by people. And now I'm not talking about actual mean, horrible social media stuff, because that's also out there. And that is true. Mm -hmm. And that can cause you real trauma that can cause you real bullying and real crap, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And that should be completely dealt with accordingly. I'm talking about people who just feel offended over everything. And I'm, I start to wonder, like, are we raising that is self-traumatizing, if there's such a word? Are we encouraging a society where what is what is it going to look like for them 10, 20 years down the line if they cannot receive negative feedback at work without it causing them some sort of issue? They can't be told anything by their parents without them... So I'm like, so what is the problem that we're facing when it comes to our relationships and our communication, the time that we're living in? Is it that we are just so scared to offend people or people have just become very entitled to always feeling a certain, always getting positive stuff and unable to get mm -hmm. negative things I don't know what what are your thoughts on that one yeah that's a really good question really good that's something to think about right let me give you this little story first right so I'm not saying this for bragging but I've got a virtual assistant right who helps me on my business but he's in the Philippines yeah. right and really lovely guy and sometimes we'll have a because I'm quite interested to find out what his culture's like and he asks me questions so sometimes we'll have like a little conversation and he raised something with me the other day because obviously he sees a lot of my material. And I said to him, you're more than welcome to read it, you know, do what, you know, take it on board. He said, what's interesting, what made me think the other day, he said, is um, I think he's got a younger sister. He said, it's really weird because what I'm seeing now with her coming out of school, everybody seems, they all seem to have anxiety now and they all feel stressed and overwhelmed. That's interesting because... We've had that for quite a few years now. So it sounds like the Philippines kind of only just catching up with that element of it. Um, but I thought it was a really good observation because I said to him, do you know what? I think a lot of it is we live in a society now where everything's fast. We want action straight away. We want pinging on our phones all the time. Our brains don't ever stop. There's It's just hypo all the time whether we're talking to people, watching mm. social media, it's just we want instant gratification. And no one, not no one, that's wrong, many people don't know the art of being present. And I hold my hand up to that. That's part of my learning curve that I was mentioning earlier, right? It's stopping and breathing and being present just for a little while. But many of us don't do that at all. And I think as a result of that, we have all created our own way of being anxious and overwhelmed and everything's just, and maybe you're right, maybe we're not doing enough learning ourselves to, because we're not being present, we're not even considering what's going on in our heads. 
we're not necessarily listening to the language we're using. And when I say language, I'm not talking about swearing, like you were saying earlier, you know, I'm just awful. I'm just so ugly. Um, I'm too fat. I'm too thin. Everyone hates me. Actually, everyone hates me. Now, why would you think every everybody? You know, and then it, it just gets taken all out of perspective doesn't it and then that causes more stress and overwhelm so if we just took a couple of steps backwards and got just stopped every now and again and this is what I teach my clients now I teach them six 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 breathing I know there's lots of different types of breathing but this one is in for six out for six for your nose just do that a few times and just calm yourself down And then when you start getting these looping thoughts, I'm stupid, I'm ugly. No, let's just stop and listen to that thought. Let's acknowledge it and go, really, is that true? No, it's not true, is it? And then you sort of change state by smiling or something like that. And then go and do something different. Just go and laugh. Just go and dance. Just go and have some fun so you can release some dopamine and serotonin in your body. But we're frightened to do that. Because we're not, and then by doing that, then we're releasing feelings and emotions out of our body. But because yeah. we're not doing any of that, we're not evolving. Yeah. I find it just really fascinating how this is the parent in me speaking with a nine year old and a five year old. Oh, as you know, sometimes my daughter will say something to me, and I'm like, how did you come to that conclusion that it seems very dramatic? You know, it's like, And she's not a spoiled child, you know, she's not an entitled child, but her way she's, she's very articulate in the way she expresses herself. And she'll come up with these phrases like, well, uh, you can't force me to do this and this. I know my rights. And I'm like, calm down, (laughs) calm down. (laughs) Can't hit me, you know, it's against law. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to put time Not not even that. Uh, You can't force me to eat vegetables. I'm like... It's like, oh, really? you, you, can you first of all just be thankful that you've got some food let's start there be thankful that yeah. you've got food on your plates yeah and uh, no one's shoving vegetables down your throat but it goes to that extreme like you can't force me to eat you can't force me to do what I want I don't want to eat the vegetables you can't force me mommy I know my rights and I know you can't and I, I joke about it I know she's nine and so on but you know just yeah. but is it quite the worrying? concept yeah. of yeah. how yes how is this going to affect how we turn up in our relationships? Not just mm. our romance. So is, how are we turning up in a romantic? Are we expecting our partners to provide this instant gratification? And when they don't, there's something wrong, leave the relationship. Are we yeah. living in a culture that is so quick to replace people and replace things, mm. uh, complain about stuff, be unsatisfied, have an attitude of instant gratification, have an attitude of everything is quite hard everything brings me anxiety and by the Mm. way I just want to put this out there as a caveat I am by no means underestimating that there is real anxiety Mm. there is real depression there is real mental health Mm. I've been affected by it on a personal level those who know me well know that my brother committed suicide after a depressive episode so it is not something yeah, that you're going to be. So it is, I'm not trying to belittle mental health here. Yeah, uh-huh. I'm not trying to do that. I'm not trying to uh-huh. belittle anxiety. I'm just trying to question us as a society how mm. our programming is affecting how we are turning up in our relationships, whether it's with ourselves, mm. with our partners, with our children, with our work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, my heart goes out to you and your family because that is just horrendous. And it's such a waste of a life, isn't it? That's the sad thing about it. And I'm sure he would have gone through different therapeutic, you know, organisations and processes and things. But to end like that, just oh, it just really saddens me, really, really does. And I think that's why we, I think you're right. I think society now is, like we said earlier, it's kind of very, very throwaway and very, we don't, we don't really always appreciate who we are therefore we don't appreciate other people and then that has that knock-on effect and then like you say if you're bringing your children up in that environment of 
not really respecting each other and don't come anywhere near me because, you know, I know my rights and all that kind of stuff. You're not going to hang around. You're not going to put up with that. However, I guess the other side of the fact is that there's going to be so many people of that same ilk, isn't there, that you're you're just going to be putting those types of people all together all the time. Would that Does that mean that that will work as a couple or does that just mean that that relationship is going to last you know, almost zero amount of time. To kind of yeah. understand where our programming comes from, uh, see what's working for us, what's not working for us, where there's trauma, seeking out the help that you need. Mm. Um, and maybe more so for the younger listeners as well, understanding if there is a real mental health issue, please do seek help. Please go out and speak to someone, whether it's your GP, psychologist, psychiatrist, Mm. therapist, coach, rabbi or priest. Seek out help. Family members that you know will have your best interest at heart. Please do not think that it's magically going to go away. I just really want to reiterate that. And on the other side of that, you know, that's why I brought up my daughter who is nine years old to to bring in some context of, of not necessarily humor, but of like the difference between actual mental illness or men- mental health issues, as opposed to an entitlement, instant gratification mm-hmm. attitude. And, yeah. you know, just food for thought as well. And then there is that, and then there's the trauma in between. And how do we address our trauma so that we don't continue? Um, a friend of mine said this very well. She said, we'll continue to bleed our wounds will continue to bleed onto others, even though they never cut us. I've I've seen people get in the re- relationships even recently, like, and they didn't last five minutes. And the reason it didn't last five minutes was because it was a girl and a boy situation. That's not always obvious nowadays, is it? But yeah. they got together. He really liked her, but after about two weeks, she started to get a bit funny, and she started accusing him of things and. If he said, oh, we couldn't be there because he was doing his, he was at university. So he was, you know, he had exams and he was going, I can't see it tonight because I need to study. And then she'd like flip. But it turned out that she had had several relationships before that had ended with them being unfaithful to her. And in the end, I said, no, you need just, just, you need to get out now because there's no way you're going to be, that's going to be a healthy relationship. If you're having those types of issues in week three or four, no. Nah. Yeah get out yeah. but that was a case of bringing in old I mean personally I would have liked to have worked with her and unraveled it all because <laughs> yeah. that's how my brain works I was, I'm, I'm like but hang yeah. on I wonder why yeah. she's reacting like that why is she attracting the wrong type of you know and da, 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 da. why is she self-sabotaging because I see things differently to most people <laughs> yeah. but until she addresses that and comes to work with someone like me and get real get to the root cause of that that's going to be her behavior going forward you know she might get further in a relationship but it will it won't be a happy relationship because in the end that person who's probably a nice person is going to end up going you know what if I'm being accused of being unfaithful I might as well go and do it because that's what a lot of people do isn't it they go well I can't I can't be in this anymore so I might as well just go and do what I'm accused of and you know, and then if you throw a few kids into that equation as well, as time progresses, they're seeing all of that. Yeah. And then that's learned behavior for them, isn't it? And they're gonna go on and do the similar thing. Yeah, generational patterns continue, you know. Mm. It's like what we're saying about the the beating of with the by, by the parents and how the it just continues. But Julie, I really want to thank you so much. It's been such an interesting conversation, but just for the sake of time, I'm going to um, wrap this up. But before we do, first of all, I want to thank you so much for all your input and everything you've shared and your stories as well. It's It's been a really interesting conversation. I know we've touched on a couple of things um, and I think that's how it keeps it exciting. Before I let you go, Julie, please share with the listeners um, what is the best way to get in touch with you? So, as we said at the beginning, my business name is called Millicide, which is M I L L I E S I D E, therapy and coaching. So, I have a YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, all under the same name. And yeah, so on my YouTube channel, actually, I've 
um, got all my live interviews that I've done. So I do a weekly Instagram live, not on a particular day or time. I get guests on, which you're coming on in a couple of weeks' time, my love, aren't you? Yes, uh, I am. Very excited. Excited. <laughs> so on there, I've got all the interviews I've done, but I've also got my client testimonials on there. So some of my clients very kindly come on and do an interview like this, as you know, in this kind of format as well. And they share their stories of what it, where they were and what it was like working with me and how they're living their lives now. So if anyone's really interested in, in finding out more, go to my YouTube channel or find me on all my social medias and just start following me. That'd be really amazing. Um, I look forward to seeing you there. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. And I will be putting the links onto the show notes. So make sure you connect with Julie as well. Do subscribe to her YouTube channel as well. That would be fantastic. And um, I thank you once again, Julie, for this. Really, really appreciate it. Um, I want to thank all my listeners as well for uh, being on this journey with me. I hope you've got lots of value from this conversation. As always, I always do ask, please share the episodes. You never know who needed to hear a message. There's something Julie or myself might have shared and somebody else in your circle of friends or network might have needed to hear the message. So please go ahead and do share the podcast as well. I appreciate you all for tuning in each week. Keep turning up every Thursday. We're dropping new episodes. Until next week, I'll see you then. Bye. Have a blessed week, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Love You Want podcast. I hope you learned something from this episode. Before you go, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a five-star rating and a positive review. For the links and resources mentioned, you may go to the show notes. Thanks and see you again next week for another intimate session with me, your host, Anne Helbring.